uh, and I will talk about protein domains, protein domain assignments, protein domain databases, and a bit about actually about our own work. It's a few years old now, but um, it's, this paper is a paper that one of my PhD students wrote some years ago, uh, and it's, a, it, it's related to the whole structure, of prediction point of view, but it's a bit of a description of what, what the domain is, and it's not, um, uh, it, 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 it was not obvious, my, the domain is a very important concept in, in for proteins, and I think we have, you already looked at it partly, but I will try to focus a bit more about it and how actually it has been important for the evolution of proteins, for the functions, and it's, it's not a, always a very, very clear description because the domain definition is all, not always extremely straight uh, forward. Particularly, it's like you know, where do you draw the line between the domain and just a short extension of the protein, etc. And domains, even within the domain family, it is um, there are variations in, in, in the in the structure of it. So I, I will try to get to that. If there's something you want, just ask. Uh, so the idea. What is was was detected quite early was that protein domains, the proteins, many proteins consist of several domains. Well, these are actually not; these are all single domains. Uh, so these are so this is a single domain protein. So say this, and the domain is often defined in two different ways. It is either defined as a structure unit, and so that's a part of a protein that can fold by itself. So these are, these, these are a compact and they hold together. So you could say if you would combine them together, you would put one of these together to that one, they would be separate to each other. You could chop the protein into two parts and fold together. But it's also an evolutionary concept where domains can be recombined with other domains. So you can find a protein that has this and this together, and then, but you can find that one maybe combined with that one also, so you have different domains merged together. So it, it, it's both an evolutionary and uh, structure concept. Uh, however, it is um, not always the case that, um, uh, in most cases, in many cases, these kind of structure and evolutionary concepts agree. So in many cases, they are, they are maybe you use evolution, this, the domain definition agree, but it's not always, not always the case. So in some cases, you would divide things differently. And there are, the good domain derivative is usually some kind of manual decision because it's not always trivial to make this decision. But the reason why you have it is basically because you have these multi domain proteins. So you have uh, this protein has like three clear domains. It's a red domain, or actually, this is like three different proteins, or two proteins with three domains. So it has uh, one red, one yellow, one blue. And this protein is actually quite similar, it's not the same protein, but you see that here you have actually a definition of another uh, one. Combination. This is this is this, this here is, is fused together. Here is a two different domains, and also this one is actually the other way around. It's actually two domains that are split together like that. So you can you, so you can try to identify what is the domain here by looking at the structures, compare the structures. So you can see that what is happening is that somehow at least with the yellow and blue one, well, this part of the blue one is that these two, in this case, is one protein. Here are two proteins. So this, these are two domain protein, this is one domain protein. Yeah. And there are many examples of this. So, so there are many things like, that, that's a co common example, you have combination of domains that are put together. And then particularly, if you look at it from a genomic perspective, there are few types of domains, like these SH2 domains here, that are very common and combined with many other domains, while most domains are only found in a few combinations, or only one. So, domain databases. So people tried to do this for a long time, and, and really there was the first database that worked was kind of basic structures. So I will start talking about them. And the first one was SCOP. And SCOP used so that that was really made by one person basically, Alexei Mershin. So that's the paper you have here. And what it did is that it, it took a st structural perspective of all proteins, looked at all protein, divided into domains and classified how these relate to each other. So it used well, some kind of class here. This is just how much alpha helix and beta sheets have. And it used folds in class called Tolly. 
super family and family. The idea is that, that Putas are in the same family are homologous, relate to each other. So they are clearly have the same sequence and they do the, most cases they do the same functions as us. There are proteins that are recent applications from each other. Superfamily are cases where there is, according to Alexa Mercian, a homologous relationship, but it's not at that trivial to detect. The sequence similarity is very, very low. There might be actually uh, clear differences in the functions. And uh, you pr- might not even be able to detect this without looking at the structure. But it, so this is basically more distant relation, re- relatives, but still, according to the Lux emotion, they have a homologous relationship. And this is, of course, most cases probably people agree, but there was a particular case where people can have different opinions and you have to argue one way or another. And then you have a category fold, which basically should be two domains that are not homologous, but look the same. The typical example would be the, like this uh, Tim Barrels here I talked to some time before that are all basically the same, they all look like this but according to election motion they are most likely not homologous well some of them are but, but they are distinct groups because the function is very different because the active side is very different sites etc etc there are people that argue the other way around but that, that's, that can be argued about so if you look at scope so this is actually the uh, scope database had a problem for a long time because it was not up to date. Uh, scope, yes. Is it scope that the E or is it scope? Uh, it was scope and then now it's a scope E because that's the uh, if you go to scope except which is in Cambridge the scope which is 1.75 has problems for update for four years or three years after that so because uh, Alexa Mersh, so so this is kind of a clone of it and it's um, uh, Stephen Brenner who uh, was a part of the development in the beginning also, but he has basically ta- taken sco- SCOP 1.75 and made it 2.0 version, now it's 2.04. While Alexia Merck is making a completely new database called SCOP 2. So this is SCOP E 2.0. But it's, um, so this is, it, but basically the same, the same idea of SCOP is after this is actually up to date. This is actually, has the whole PDB or more or less in, in, in it. So yeah, it, it was basically it was manual, and, and the difference is that everything in this novel is very few of these are manually classified. Most of these are database, uh, it's not automatically classified. So if you look at here, you have first on the class level, so this is the anti scope, you can go to scope 1.75, it's, it's not up to date and the website is uh, it's not as nice. But you have all alpha or beta, so you put it all have, only have alpha helices, only have beta sheets, have alpha and beta sheets that are mixed together and alpha and beta sheets that are separated together so they, they divide into different, two different groups there and then you have some multi-domain proteins which classify specifically this is like a few small cells here and like memory proteins that classify in special class some small proteins that are mainly peptides etc some coiled cores so that's some, some, some bit special thing peptides design proteins so there's a few special classes down here but in general these four top ones cover most of the Structures. So this, well, the multi domain is actually quite a lot of also nowadays. So we just take the alpha ones and look at that. We can look at what, how, so this is the full, this is class level. So now we go to fold level. So, the, so all the alpha helices proteins can be divided into folds. And there are, in this case, there are 285 different folds. So 285 types of structures that are similar. And they are classified like. I mean, here, so this, the first one here is globin life, so that's my globin. There are six helices, the folded leaf, and it's partly open. The next one is a long alpha helipin, which is two helices, and the antiparallel helipin, three helices, etc. So these are structurally, they all are alpha helicopter, but they're structurally distinct. They are small figures you have to look like. Well, it's not as easy to see, but they, they are differently. But you see, even with three helices, there are many different versions, you can make three different helices, packed different, right? Similar. Hi, the architect is similar to the winged helix, whatever that is. But to- topology is different, so you basically how the order is. And you have a right handed to left, say the shift or left handed shift. So they are structurally quite different from each other. And uh, I don't think anybody really would argue that any of these are really homologous to each other. If you then say the global ones, you see there are two superfamilies in this family. So there are two types of globins. So in according to Alexa Mershin, there are two completely non homologous types of globins. And that's 
ferrodoxins, or alpha helical ferrodoxins, and the globin like one. So the difference is that they look quite similar in structure, but this is has a heme group in it, and this has a uh, iron sulfur cluster, I think. Uh, and of course, there is a there's more information when I uh, arrived in this uh, timetable line here, etc. So this has, but still, within the globin like families, there are five, globin like superfamily, there are five families, and there are I don't know whether it's 46 out of 456, but 458, I don't know what it is. Mm. Yeah, I, I don't know what it is. I guess it's the number of members, but it doesn't really make sense. That's something strange. Yeah. Maybe some kind of access number? Yeah, it's a bit strange. I don't know why it's. Yeah, I thought it should be number of members, but it can't be the same in both cases, and it's like this one bigger, one higher. <laughs> so I can't really tell. <coughs> I, think it's a, I think it should be number of members, but I think it's a bug. This is my guess. So if you go to globins, so that's my, you have uh, a number of families. So all, all these proteins, according to Alex Merchant, are homologous. So they all had one common origin. They all do more than the same thing. They all bind oxygen. Most of these bind oxygen in one way. Some are maybe not really oxygen binding because they lost capacity. But you have a heme group binding, there's no more globin. You have phycocyanins. For, for a while, people. Argue that phycocyanins and globins were uh, different uh, families of homology uh, homologous to each other because the function is quite similar. But it was a structure of solid, solid was a structure similarity very high. And nowadays, with modern, with bigger sequence databases and modern sequence search tools, you can quite easily detect the homology between these. So the sequence similarity is, I mean, it's not high, but with, with the proof of proof alignment, you detect it. Then there's some that truncate the lack of first helices. So this is variation, so it doesn't have six helices, it has five helices, because it lost one part of it. it lost one helix. And uh, these are also lost lack of first helices, but it's sim more similar to coronary globins than the truncated ones. Okay, nerve tissue, mean hemoglobin. So that this, and then there's some, auto, some not a true family or something. Okay, that's one protein. So here you see you have uh, 27 protein domains here in this globin ones. And you have uh, two there, seven in the phycocyanins ones. You can go down further down, and you go look at the hemoglobin. And hemoglobin you have domain one, and so this this this, this um, are then hemoglobins, and you have bacterial dimeric hemoglobins. No, hemoglobins are normal tetramers, and there are the cytoglobins, and certain myoglobin further down somewhere, etc. Chimera came from beta alpha, which then are inside. So there are numbers up here. And it, this is, I see, this is only it has 31 pdbm, so this is the big one. The normal globins are further further down, so there are more, more entries there. And you can, also, you, can, you can click even further down, and you look, click on one of these, and you end up with the ascaric hemoglobins, and you have a model over here, you can click, and you can get to the pdb, and uh, etc. And the, this is the domain called 1ASH, the PDB code D, and the, then this, the first domain is a single domain. Because of course, even a PDB file can contain many domains. So, th this was the first attempt to, or well, first successful attempt, I would say, to, to classify domains. And this has been very, very useful. It was useful for many things. For instance, for benchmarking. If you, if you want to know how good a method of sequence searching is, or for structure prediction or anything, you need to basically. No the answer. So if you do homology searching, as I showed you the other day, when you have this plot, this rock plot, you say uh, this is method finds so many, this method finds fewer of these. This is also the baseline. So like you had, I want to find all the members in a superfamily. So if I take a superfamily here, what? Yeah, in the Google family. So I take one super member of a superfamily, I want to find another one. And if I, if, if I take them that are not in the same family, they know that these are the related ones, and many of these are difficult to find. So if my met method finds more of these, I have a better method. And of course it was also, so it was very useful resource. The problem was somehow that this, it was very difficult to keep updated, because you kind of relied on one person classifying it. And today when we have a few hundred structures solved every day, it gets quite time consuming. A lot of it can be done manually, but it's, that's basically it was not up to date. And this scope 2 seems to be, is a, Basically, automatic match to it, so it's much, much faster, it skips up today. 
quite soon after that, there was the release the competitor, also in England. So that's Cass by Christina Rengo and co-workers. So Cass was some of how it's more developed to be semi-manual automatic. Still, there is a manual component. In particular, the, diff the thing that is difficult to do uh, automatically is the division of um, uh, domains. Really, there are methods that try to define a domain from a big protein. Or and you do it, but it's 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 not. In many cases, in many cases it works, but in many cases we also need a manual assignment. So the, so cat cat is more up to date. Still not completely up to date all the time, and there are a couple of new attempts to even rate that are more up to date. Uh, and they have they have a few nice exemptions. So you can download it. You can browse and search here. So you have two hundred thirty three thousand eight hundred fifty eight. Cat domains, so it's almost one year, more, it's more than one year old. So it's like it hasn't kept up, updated for a year. Uh, so they have, I mean, no, in the, no, that time probably PDB was on the average, maybe eight to ninety thousand PDB files. So they have two and a half or three domains per, per, per protein on average. They classified into superfamilies in 2007 and 38, and uh, yeah, it has 70,000 PDB files. So, so it's slightly more than three domains per PDB file on average. Um, but that's PDB structure, and one they can contain more than one chain. And they have what they call the gene three D. It's basically they have, they have taken genes, genomes, and assigned by sequence searching, by homology searching, by proof of proof alignments, these domains to the genes. So basically, you can go to any genome that they have run, say. This domain is found here and here and here. And this has been also done for a lot of interesting analysis. I will tell you something about our work at the end of the lecture. So in a single way, you can browse here, you can click here, and it has a category which is uh, uh, the top pairs, mainly alpha, mainly beta, alpha, beta, and a few secondary structures. So this is like the same 10 categories that Scott has. They only have four here, but that's it's just a choice, basically. So you have alpha, beta, Big alpha beta and then some some small factor small ones. So if you look at alpha ones, they have nice graphics here, which you actually if you had a, if the network was working, you could click on it. So this is the class architecture topology of the superfamily. So class is just the one set. Architecture is somehow a general description of the fold bit more that is not doesn't exist in, in, in scope. Topology is the same idea as as as, as folds, but the structures they look the same. And homologous superfamily so is basically things that are homologous where you have sequence similarity. And then you can go further down also. So in, you see in this class, I think this is the all alpha proteins. No, this is all. So you have, I guess this is alpha, beta, mixed, and the small for a few secondary structures you have there. So if you click on that one here, it expands and just looks at this part over here. So you get to something higher, and you have an example of a model, the all alpha protein here. This is actually what is called main alpha, actually, because it has a bit, bit, bit of sheet. I don't know, I don't know, don't know what the protein is, but it's called 27A00. So then the class is always the same, but then you see, you have topologies, you have basically, uh, I think you have two classes, which one is called. Um, uh, Globe or bundle, the one is called sheet, something like that. So, so, you can go on, so they have here, yeah, orthogonal bundle is called. So, orthogonal bundles is now the green one here, and that is then divided into a number of different folds or topologies. So, you see here, so expanding here, you see there are a couple of them that are very popular, but there are many small ones also. You expect, click on the ones that, that belong to globins, so you have a globin like one, so I know you see here. In globins you have you see one big family, a small one, and then a few things up here. So you can click further here on the alpha here uh, on the globins ones, and you end up on this page, which tells you something about so cast family 1.1.490.10, which are globins. And you can look at things that have like the gene ontology diversity. So among the globins, what different function has been assigned to it? Uh, is there uh, different enzyme activities, is it different the species, there are different, different species here, uh, you have enzyme function, is domain organization, is it combined with other domains, that, 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 that,
they can go for, look into further here, so what is fine with. So it, it, it's rather useful. So for instance, if you look at the functional families here, you can basically have divide these globins into uh, the hemoglobin group here and the some uh, truncated hemoglobin that is the oxygen binding or second dependent protein here and uh, some other beta globin and neuro globin that are those. So it's three distinct functional categories in the global ones. If you look at the superposition, you can look, take all the structures and superpose them on top of each other or it's already done. So you see that the structure variations here, they are not similar, but those are, they are partially different. And then you can click further on and set it on as well. So, 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 so this is the structure classification. The problem with structure classification is, of course, that we can only classify proteins that have a structure. And in particular, 10 years ago, there were many proteins that didn't have structures. And today, it's still a large part of particular memory proteins that we don't have a structure for. So, there is a need also for uh, purely sequence-based classification domains. And here you have used the evolutionary definition much more. And the, w the method that really worked here was the one called PFAM. I don't know, did you use it in some lab? I think you might have. I don't remember. I think I, think I talked about it in, in the domain database. So PFAM, I mean, people have tried to do it before. So basically, you could imagine that you take all the sequences and try to divide them into domain and you try to cluster together and you try to make an automatic pipeline that uh, defines what the domain is, and you do that. So basically, you take the most similar ones, you put them together, and you, do, you divide the proteins when you don't have hits, etc. And that people done that, and it sort of works. The problem with it is that, that every time you do it again, you get a different answer. So if you have no more sequences, you're going to get a different answer. So PFAM was, was, was really the first attempt, well, one of the first attempts, to actually make databases that somehow consistent through history. So the idea is, of course, that you have proteins that look like that. You have, like, uh, for instance, voltage gated storage channels and ABC transports that are different, but they all, ha all have these CBS domains, whatever that is. And uh, the, the CBS domains exist in these, but they also exist in the alone, in just combination of these. And uh, uh, also exist with the, some input D, DH, which exists without it also, and then also with the system B synthesis. So this domain here, CBS, Whatever that means, uh, can be combined in many different ways. So this is a really example of typical well, of a multi-domain protein. So the idea is to describe each of these blobs here that, from, that are evolutionary related as an entry in the PFM database. And in particular, in the, if it's common, you have it in the PFM A database. So in PFM A, what you do is you take and to make it consistent, you have what is called a seed alignment. So basically you take a set, a rather small set of sequences from these domains that are representative. And the good thing with the seed alignment is that if there's something wrong with it, it's quite easy to change it. So if you realize that your domain actually consists of two types of domains, it should be divided, or it's too long or too short, or something like that, later you get new information, you can change it. But you only have to change that seed alignment, you don't have to change the whole database. So this seed alignment, yes, it's a multiple sequence alignment that at least is manually curated somehow, someone looks at it, it probably is done not so difficult. And then using the Hidomark model, st standard Hammer Hidomark model, that you're using the seed alignment, so then you detect many other members of this alignment. And then, so you get full alignment, so you get, so you get all the members from all the uh, Unipod database that belongs to this domain. And this way, of course, you can check that you only get hits for one domain and one protein. You can define the cutoffs. That is, so you can define that you, you only have, uh, they should be this strong to be here, otherwise it belongs to that family. You can make sure that there are, you are not, a uh, 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 lot of previous hits that are wrong, etc. So you, can, you can play around with it. If something doesn't look good, you can actually go back and change things from the beginning. And then, in addition, to the C alignment, you have, uh, you put actually, which is important, lot nice description of the family that includes uh, function rotation, thresholds, etc. Uh, so basically the rule is here, here to do is these new false positives. And nowadays actually I think each PFAM, or not all, but many PFAM families have a Wikipedia entry. So that's the kind of way they go to Wikipedia. 
So they, they use Wikipedia for annotations. And uh, so how big is it today? And this is probably also a few years old. So, so basically, say, um, the first 2,000 families covers about 65%. So there, there are a few families, like a few thousand, so like the same, more or less the same number as super families in Scopecast, that covers a large part of all the proteins we know, 65%. And then there are many, many, many more small families. So these, I think it's it close to 10,000 families a day. But most of these, like 80% of these, are <coughs> small and do not have very many hits. So these are, this, but, and this is very typical for most genomic studies we do, is that there are a few families, few evolution events that are very, very common, and there are rare, many, many rare events. So rare, rare proteins here. So the, 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 this was for a long time a discussion on how many protein families exist, or how many protein folds exist. And it really depends, sure, maybe 2,000 covers two-thirds of everything, but then there are maybe 10 or even 100,000 other ones that are very rare. So it's a bit of a definition question. And because it's always really related to these ones or not, that's that that can be discussed. So why does the curl look, well, so basically this is the big families, it covers like that, the space, and you make smaller, smaller, Basically, you end up with a logarithmic curve until you end up with nothing left. And then, uh, as I said here, this is also a couple of years ago, you have P from B. So basically, P from A covers 75% or 74% of the sequences. So what do you do with the rest? Basically, there you don't have a demand declaration, so you run an automatic class clustering these. So you basically take these and you cluster everything similar together. And of course, if you, find, if you find some big families there, that's the best candidates for the next generation of uh, P from A. But men, these are much worse classified. There are a couple of hundred thousand of these, and they are not as well classified, and they are um, um, certainly not uh, described functional uh, as well. And many of these are probably related to, in some way to some P from A family, but it's just the sequence is similar to big enough to detect it. Well, this is actually really old because I think this is, so this is P from, so they have a lot of data, it's a good database. It's, 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 these three places around the world and it's updated every six months of that. So I think they are to version 34 now or something like that. So it's, it's, this is a bit old. So, just to show an example of multi domain protein, so this is also a typical example of multi domain protein where you have uh, SS3 domain, SS2 domain, a kinase, which has two domains also. And this is functionally, so they are SS2 and SS3 bind to something and then they get phosphorylated and then you have a signal that is uh, can give another phosphorylated matrix. So it's a way of like the function to move along. And and these SH2 and SH3 domains in particular, they are found in many other combinations. So they are among the most common domains. Domains that are found in many, many different combinations. Okay, so I wonder if they actually can get to, to look at PFAM because it's, it's a nice thing to look at. Yes, how I interpret. Mean, so if you go to PFAM, well, there's, there's a, see, there are a couple of different places, but if you go to PFAM here, yeah, it's not normal. So for instance, if you take. Uh, oh, okay, no, Keyword should take our my global in Oresto. You see that my globins are uh, uh, well, it's a global family. So if you go to this, it's P fan 0042. And it's one, so this is the structure of it, of the deoxyhemoglobin. So you see this is 1, 2, 3, 4 subunits. Well, something for, for, for proteins in this case. So the, the description is actually is a Wikipedia page. It looks like just like Wikipedia. And it has some, I see it has subfamilies nowadays. 
uh, what you have here, so you can look at domain organization. So that's like, ha, 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 what is global found with? So global is maybe not the best example, but it, it is there are some combinations. You see that 3,942 sequences are found with, with architecture globin and nothing else. While 1,780 sequences are found with the globin and then whatever that is, uh, oxidorexins found, found by the domain and the non binary domain, traditional domain of oxidorexins. <coughs> and this is in yeast, it seems to be mainly yeast. And then there are 56 sequences that are found with two, so there's very few, but two globins. So I guess in Daphnia, the water flea, that you seem to have two globins together, and you have some other small pro. Well, it's not happen. And here you have a fault binding domain, so here, here you have in four sequences in, with nine globins in some shrimp. I have no idea why it has it. Uh, so you can look at uh, clans. So there's a globin, the clan is like a super family. It's not, it didn't exist in the original peat farm, but it's kind of existed, uh, well, they add, added it afterwards, and it's actually quite uh, uh, useful. Uh, Excuse me, what's yeah. How do you describe the difference between the superfamily and the farm? Well, they, 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 PFAM didn't do it, or PFAM used the term of families. I mean, so for, in a structure perspective, you had the superfamilies were uh, structures that were uh, distantly related, they're homologous. So when PFAM did it, they didn't care, they cared about setting up things that were, were unique families. However, there are many families that are distant relative to each other. So here you have, for instance, globins, you have the bacteria globin, the globin, the fact that it's some proteoglobins. So you have four different p -fam families. And then also they detected that these, if you do sequence search, you find homology between them. So they, 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 they also created a clan level, which I would more or less correspond to superfamily level at, at, uh, in, in scope of calf. It's not, these, these distinctions are very, it's like a manual choice to large extent when you do it. But basically, both superfamilies and clans should be things that are homologous. So you have a sequence similarity between the proteins, but it's often, but it should be often it's hard to detect it. So, it's, so there's a distant relationship, and in the family there should be a close relationship. So you, so you have a clan here. You can do the same thing here in, in the domain organization here. Uh, you can also go to species. So you see what, what, what species this works. Okay, it was too big. Sorry, we have to think on this. If you have a bunch if you look at species, maybe. Yeah, yeah. Right. So this is the distribution of where globins are found. So this is, is eukaryotes and this proteas. found both in eukaryotes and so Some domains are only found in some some particular uh, kingdoms. So, and here you can see here it's in bacteria, it's in protobacteria, and all these other types. It's uh, in uh, mammals and in rodents and humans, somewhere, I guess, primates, and I guess maybe humans. I guess you can even click on somehow. You, yeah, or you only get. And you can, you can, you can get alignments, or. It's now you selected four and a quarter sequences. If I go to the ones in bacteria, I select another two thousand sequences. So I can get, so I can get an alignment with this. I can click and I get a fast alignment. I didn't show up, but uh, there you are. I can go find the three, how these relate to each other. I can look at the whole HMM, so this is the hidden market model. Or like the log of that. Okay, so, if I, sorry. So here there's a position 14, there's a conserved eye solution, I guess it looks like. Let's see if we can make it smaller. Well, not that much. I can look at the alignments. I can look at the. Let's see if I can go to look at the um, seed alignment. Uh, again, I there maybe. So here I have an alignment of the 
of the proteins why it's not the easiest form to read but I have all the proteins aligned in the gaps so this I can use for making muscle physics alignment or something like that it's not the best format but that I need to get your view to work so there, there are a lot of useful things here and uh, uh, but let's, let's, let's have a look at another domain family search for one that is very very common SH2 so I have a SH2 domain here P found 0017 so one, one, also one early one and if you look at the domain organization so this is the structure of it looks at that sheet and two helices if you look at the domain organization you see that there are uh, well, the most common one is something which has just some kind of low complexity region here but it's also combined with uh, kinase as we saw in smaller picture it's combined with stop binding proteins it's combined with uh, uh, phosphotyrosine interaction domains there are another kinase combination here a two SH2 domain and phosphatase there are SH2 domains with something uh, disorder regions in between there are rho gap there are uh, pH domains it's, no, it's, a, it's a lot of different combinations and you see that these numbers are not that small it's not like if, if you go down to the bottom you think that I only found like a 5 and 10 sequence maybe they can be wrong but these are kind of common so you can look I mean, if you, so if you look at one protein here for instance you see that this has these domains uh, P from A start domain is that alpha domain so starting 2016 something that you think is low complexity disorder for it and, and, and the start binding domain P from A here that's C domains and then the S2 domain and then start seeds of the domains. So you can jump further if you look if you look at that domain of course you can look at what what other domains is found in. So this one is found here like that, but it's also it's also found in this green and red start domains. But sometimes the green domain is missing. Sometimes you have a, uh, this uh, six domains is found in not in some but not in all. So there, there are a lot of different combinations here. And these are all the same domain here. So, uh, so, so and of course, this thing suppose, tells you a lot about what the domain does, it tells you a lot about the function, and it tells you a lot about uh, uh, how uh, the evolution of this protein happened. So, we started, uh, maybe I should take the break now, and I keep on that after the break. I think. Sorry, let's tell you what we did. So we, we started some projects almost 10 years ago now, two of my students. But we, we, we wanted to ask some questions. One, we, we, one question we wanted to ask is how does this evolve? So how, how common is it? How, can we find some rules how these domains are combined together? Because the idea is, of course, that there are somehow in evolution uh, that has been an assignment to one domain or, to the, uh, or maybe like fusion proteins or loss of domains, something like that. And we say, can we find some rules about that? Another problem we had that is, was a common problem, it's slightly less common problem now, is like how do we deal with these non assigned regions? So often, I mean, you use P Famoscop, you have a sequence, and you can do some assignments, use Hammer, some, some HMM models, and you get some hits. In P1, you can also get P1 B hits. But then you have domains here in the middle, and, um, and we call them, if they were long enough, we call them orphan domains. We said, but this is something that is not similar to anything else in, 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 in the uh, database. Because uh, if there was similar to anything else, we would find that. We did our mass, it's basically our own uh, P-Fan-B version that we made this, uh, uh, that we found. So we basically said, okay, so let's try to deal with it. So the other question, so the question we first asked was, how many domains are found in different species. In a, in a typical gene and different species, how many domains are found. And the reason we had to deal with this is because even today, the coverage of p is not so good. So these different genomes, and see it's, it's in order 75%, something like that. It's probably a bit high now, but it's not. There's a large part we don't assign, and it hasn't decreased that much. So let's talk about that after coffee break. Let's meet at the 11. Okay. So, uh, the Germans. Uh, 
so we should, uh, so basically I said, this is also a few years old, but it hasn't changed so much. There's always some part of every genome, or the, or the genes in the genome that we cannot assign to any piece of domain. Because there are, part of it is this is low complexity regions I talked about some time before, and part of it is this, uh, things that have, I mean, are between domains, are short things, and th some parts are, are parts that are uh, novel coding material, as we've seen before, and so other parts are maybe things we just don't miss. And that's probably in order to end the of that. But, uh, so if you did it, this is some years ago, so you did, did that. If did, did, anyway, we divided this type of proteins into, we, well, we tried to assign everything into different categories. We had a P from A or a SCOF classification, we had a P from B or a MOS classification, and we had, we called it orphans domains, so that if they are longer than 100 residues, if longer than 200, we call them two domains. And then we can call it domain adjacent regions, so, so regions that are close to a domain level but are shorter than 100 residues. We try to play around with this length difference, but that, the 100 was a good number. If you did that, you could see basically, uh, so this was basically what you had in different, uh, if you have a eukaryotes, bacteria, and some archaea, but basically you can see that in those days we had a much better assignment in. Uh, uh, in bacteria, they had a eukaryote, so they had about 59% assigned to P from A, so they had better coverage. It's probably still the case. And it, this is not a pr of genes, this is, this, is, this is a residue, so that's a lo large part of the proteome you do. And then you had a P from B, was in that still those days bigger in uh, eukaryotes. And to get to, together, P from A and P from B was in the almost two thirds to three quarters of the genomes. And in SCOP, it's similar. You see that the, the, the assignment region here is slightly smaller, maybe for the, for the scope. That's mainly the member proteins are missing. And then you have uh, s s some of these orphan things that are long regions that we haven't assigned that are is a much bigger part in the UK, uh, in the scope than in, 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 in PIFA. There are more things missing. And then we have some of these domain of these regions that have 10% of that. So there are still some parts here that are bigger, big proteins that we haven't seen here. Yeah. And it's got that's mainly part of this memory for this IKEA was very few cases, so you can't say anything about it. So, so somehow we got something on this. We have like, so we have quite good coverage there, but it's the same thing again. Okay. And if you do that and you, do, and you look at the genome and you look at how many domains do you have in the genome, and you do that in IKEA bacteria and eukaryotes, and you can do it actually you can do it in different ways. You can do P from A or P from A plus B and scope or scope plus the mass domain. You get a very consistent answer. So you say that in P from A, or I mean, but IKEA bacteria, about 60% or almost two thirds of the proteins consist of a single domain, while in eukaryotes it's only 40%. So in, in, in bacteria, most of the proteins are single domain proteins, but while in, in uh, eukaryotes, less than half are single domain proteins. And then there are another 20% that consist of two domains, and then in Archaea bacteria, it's about 20% that consists of uh, three or more domains. While in this multi-domain, these long proteins are much more common in, uh, uh, in eukaryotes. Okay, so now you can ask the question, um, how does these evolve. So for every protein, it should be another slide somewhere. Mm. Well, I don't have it. Okay. So for so for every protein, oh, it's not very well. So for every protein, you can find the nearest neighbor. You can do this in most basic protein that has, uh, but you can find the nearest neighbor that has a different domain architecture. So domain architecture is the composition of domains in protein. So you can find a, a, a domain, so you can find the closest neighbor, and assuming then, that as, as in any other phylogenetic method, you look at the, you do partial monos, assignment saying that most likely the nearest neighbor looks like one of these proteins and something has happened to one of them. So 
you can ha you can have an insertion of a domain. So you can have a two domain protein goes to a three domain protein, or a two domain protein goes to a ten domain protein. Or you can do a loss of domains. So you can have a ten domain protein that goes to an eight domain protein. You can have, have uh, a rep replacement domain. So you have ABC is replaced by ABD, for instance. So uh, and you can do that, and you can do it in some different ways, but you basically get the same answer anyhow. With one exception that's important, and that, that is repeating domains. So protein, the domains that are found, the same domain is found many times after each other. So you can have found 10 domains of the same type next to each other, and these are a bit special. But all other domains, so insertions and deletions, in this study we didn't really know the difference between insertions and deletions. Of course, for that you need three proteins to do it. And what we noticed is that they were always happening in the beginning or the end, so the NOC terminal on the protein, very rarely in the middle. And these are three different methods to assign near, find nearest neighbors. Um, so this is, and different data sets also, so this is Swiss plot and you can do it in different ways. Basically, so basically, equally distributed between finding insertion deletions at the NOC terminal. So basically, it kind of makes sense, because like putting a domain in the middle of a protein is much more disruptive than putting it at the end. So you have a protein, you add one domain at the end, you don't disturb anything else. But if you want to put it between two domains, you need to fit two things together. It seems to be some cases that happen, it's, it's rare. And uh, these exchanges are rare in general, so basically uh, ABC to go to ABD is rare, but it also have a tendency to happen in the middle. The only difference is if you look at the, the repeats, that seems to be more comp common in the middle to uh, see some extent. Some of these we can't really assign, because we don't know where it happens, because they are basically the same thing happening all over. But there seems to be a bit more of that happening in the, uh, in the middle. And I'll come back to that in a while. So, that, so basically, it makes sense if we add domains at the end of the terminal. Next question is how many domains do we add? And it's very, very clear that we add one domain. So, like, this is the number of events we've found here, and like in 95% of the cases, it's a single domain that is added. And in the other 5% of the cases, it seems to be more, but that might be because we don't know the nearest neighbors, we don't have the, all the intermediate steps. Again, the repeat seems to be slightly different. So it seems to be more of this, but it's still dominated by the single domain thing. So you can do this, and you can look at make the following trees of this from this using this data, like any other following method. So you can see here we have a protein tyrosine kinase family. No, maybe it's SH2 domain actually, sorry. So you have an SH2 domain here, all these proteins have domains, but they say they all have different domain combinations. And then you can make a finite tree of these in different ways, and you can get you can see basically how here it seems quite clear that this protein has gained two domains here, this one has gained some domains here. It seems to be more than two, more than one in these both cases. This one here has happened is that this protein tiny in kinase domain has been added here. So here we have and also maybe this one. Here you have an SH3 domain, oh this is an SH3 domain, here you lost uh, the protein titan clade domain, so maybe common answers are here had the protein titan it was like that, and here was it. But in this one here you have, oh in this branch there I guess, you have a, you got an SH3 domain and you don't have it in this part up here. And here you are adding another PTK domain, and here you have an anchoring domain, etc, etc. Here you have one more SH2 domain, and here so you have two of them there. So, so basically, you can make a funny tree of all the events that happen together, and you can kind of summarize it, and it's, of course, it's not... Uh, and actually, we looked at it, and it looks like this is also a better description of classifying functions than if you do a purely sequence-based tree. For these proteins that have many different domains. So you can keep on asking this. And you look at um, what happens through evolution of life here. So you can take every domain and ask when did it appear in life the first in, in, on Earth the first time. And and you can also look at every domain architecture, so every combination of domain, and ask how often does it, did it appear the first time. Uh, so. To do that, we used a very rough tree. So this is basically evolution of life. So how at least kind of a consensus view it. So a couple of billion years ago, we had a common ancestor of all the kingdoms of life. Then it split into three day ways. People can argue exactly like Archaea and more similar to bacteria or something like that. But anyway, that doesn't really matter because basically this is a three-way split. And we cared about the 
you carry out so you can have a subdivision so you put all the bacteria and all the into one group well, each, each group one and then you carry out then probably for one billion years at least evolved and then split into at least three major groups yeast plant and invertebrates or, or, or the, uh, the animals and also if we argue exactly how it's split here if these are more similar but we didn't care about that this is uh, and then you have the animals split into invertebrates and vertebrates and the vertebrates you can divide into members and others and members if you, you can do much more finer and we have some rough ideas about these deep times I mean, they, they probably come wrong by 20 percent but it's a rough idea that is quite well known from fossil records and other studies so then you just ask first we ask we ask the domain so if you find domain in this 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 this, this we know it is old if it's found only this, you know that it probably was created here. If you find a domain in this, it was probably the UK after, etc. I mean, of course, we might miss things because maybe it was actually if found here. Maybe it actually existed in bacteria, but it's been lost in all bacteria. We can't say that, but that's we assume that that was, that was not the case. And so, in that case, we found 1,412 domains that were found in all three kingdoms, and 1,000 that were specific to eukaryotes. 1,000 was specific to bacteria and 200 was specific to Ikea. And this 1,129 was specific to yeast, 284 to plant, and 434 to the animals. And this 434 they were divided further into invertebrates and vertebrates and mammals. So in the mammal, you have 97 type of domain families that are unique to mammals, not found outside the mammals. At least that was the study then. And then you can actually, if we continue the time of these things, we can have kind of a rate what's happening in the how many new domains are created per million years and what you can notice then is that you can see that here in the eukaryotic and also in the metazoan so the animals there was a quite high rate compared to all other numbers so it was a, here hap, something happened when eukaryotes was a fusion of many domains also there, what's happening and they have about one new domain per million years So next question is of course, what happened with these domain architectures? So did they? So domain architecture is the same idea, but it just we take unique domain architecture, unique combination of domain A and B, or A and B and C. So you can do the same thing. So you find 363 domain architectures that were, uh, I guess this is, this is excluding the single domains. So this is 363 that were combination of domains are found in, in all kingdoms of life. And then more than 500 are found specifically in eukaryotes. And in yeast, it's only 120. And in bacteria, that's 400. Plants, there also is 400, a bit more than yeast. And you see, there quite a lot, a lot higher, high numbers here. And what you can see here, if you look at the same thing, if you look at the rates here, is that all, it was not so high here, but it was started here, but all the way in the metazoan, mammal, uh, uh, and animal, particularly the vertebrate line, lineage, it has a significant higher rate of creating new architectures than you have in um, uh, other uh, 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 earlier or in other organisms. So clearly, this explains to, large, to some extent what, what we saw earlier that 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 we have many more. Many more multi-domain architectures, multi-domain proteins in eukaryotes than we have in, in bacteria and animals, and particularly in the animals. So particularly in these animals here, we have many more rates. All animals, invertebrates, when they take this one, added 322, added to pair 64, there are many more unique to the, to the vertebrates than to the invertebrates. And the, the more uh, even the more in the invertebrates than in the plants. So this really this is an animal specific thing. So of course one thing happened here in the genomes is that we got introns in genes. That's a big, big factor that happened somewhere here. It was actually it exists in genes, but it's quite rare. Plants ha certainly have it, but uh, and of course we have a lot of expansion of these um, transposons etc. as well. So a lot of things happening. So next, as I said, these repeat domains, so in all these studies so far, 
we ignored repeated failed repeat domain A B A A A found one that next to other. We just call it one domain. We ignored it, the repeats because they were specific. So we had to ignore them. But if you look at repeats, so you look at the, how many domains of the same type you find next to each other in, in, in the protein or in the gene. You can see that this is archaea, bacteria, yeast, and, and different types of animals uh, or, or even plants. C. elegans, uh, gallus, I guess, I guess it's, uh, um, chicken, uh, Arabidopsis, and Drosophila, mouse, rat, and human. So you see here that first you see that in the archaea and bacteria, it is only about 5%. While in the uh, eukaryotes is higher, while in cell gas disease it's actually only 10% or 8%, while in 15% in uh, other animals. Uh, you can also see that the, the, uh, I mean the two domain repeats is completely dominated. So if you ignore two, two domains, you have less of one, or have about 1% in the bacteria yeast, and you have 4% here, and here you have about almost 10%, so it's much more. And also that the long ones would be like 10 plus, so it's like it doesn't exist here, but it's still it's up to a couple percent in the in, in the in the uh, humans and the rats. So these are long re long repeated proteins. Of course, we know that long repeated proteins are important for muscles, for instance, and for plants to be strong. For example, have a multicellular organism, you, you need more of that. So it's not that strange. And they are often involved in binding of proteins, so they are often involved in binding, so they are, I mean, the whole muscle fiber, the, sarc the sarcomere, because they don't repeat the proteins. The biggest protein in the human is called titin, it's in the order of, I don't know, 10,000 residues long or something like that, it has a lot of repeated domains. Uh, so this is, just, uh, this is basically, if, so if you have most fractional proteins are involved in binding, you should take the ones that have Normal proteins you have 10 to 30 percent, and the repeat families have 50 percent. And also a quite large part that is involved in, well, I guess, no, catalytic activity is much smaller because most of these proteins are. So these are my main enzymes that are not repeats, and the repeat families are not enzymes. So we looked at a bit more of this, and we did an, uh, we tried to also here try to do an evolutionary study. So what we noticed is that you can detect what's called a duplicated units. The idea we have is that you have that the, well, the people have is that it was a tandem duplication. So basically it's a duplication of a gene, but it's a duplication of a part of a gene. So you take this part and it's duplicated and suddenly you go from a five domain protein to an eight domain protein. Yeah. And of course these domains are from the same family, so they're all similar to each other, but not identical. So but at the time of the duplication, of course, domain three and six will be identical. 4 and 7 will be identical, and 5 and 8 will be identical. So if you just plot the similarity between the different genes, or the different domains, you will get something that looks like that. So you have 3 and 6, 4 and 7, 5 and 8 are identical. Well, because they're identical to yourself, so they are very similar. And then you can have some other similarities that are less stronger. But you will see a nice diagonal band. Or well, alternatively, what you can do is that you can plot the average similarity in each row, we have like shift of one, shift of two, shift of three, and you will get something like this. This is somehow average similarity. And you will have peak at three. So if you do that for different proteins, this is real data, you can end up with things like that. Here's clear duplication of one, two, three, four, six. So this is like here, when something, the end is more or less clear, but here's the clear duplication of six, and this even nine is similar to 14 and to 21. Oh, maybe 16. Maybe it's even, yeah, 15 and 21. In another protein, you have a protein that has a pattern of stack. It's the application of 2, right here. So, like, so you have uh, 5 is similar to, to 7, 6 to 8, 9 to 10, 10 to 12. So then, but, but also 5 and 6 are similar to 8, 10, and 12. So it's a several application of 2 pairs. Well, if it happened all at once, if it happened several steps, we can't say, but well, we can guess it, but it's, it's made, but it happens, it's clear it's a two duplication unit. So if you look at that, and you look at this kind of duplication units, you find patterns like this. It's like, uh, that it's clear that it's the duplication of one is, very, one is often underrepresented. Nebulin is our favorite example. 
it has a very very strong peak at 7 and nothing else you see that you have here at uh, this number here is 0 0.8 which is standard deviation above average is much much higher than anything else we have other than 0 0.1 as well so you have a duplication of 8 but, but for instance uh, LRR, the so Lucian Rich repeats, have a clear pattern at 2, I guess it is. And the sink finger has clearly that 2, 3, 4 is increased. While well, immunoglobulin has actually 1 and 2, which kind of decreases the decreasing. If you put everything together, you have an underrepresentation of 0, an overrepresentation of 2, 3, 4, and an underrepresentation of 5. So this is kind of if you put them all together. But you see, they have different patterns, they're different things. So here you have a 2, 4 pattern for anchoring. Yes? And um, does it mean? For example, at the case of the same finger 2, 3, 4, that we have uh, two duplication, a three duplication, and a four duplication? Or yeah, some cases two, some three. I mean, this is an average of hundreds of proteins. Okay. So this is just the average. And of course, even within the same protein, it could be different parts, and they have different things, you have different signals. But it's just, this is just, this part means that it's statistically significant from, 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 from zero. So there's, you have less, the one is very rare. And then in some cases it's two, some cases three, some cases four, and sometimes maybe it's I mean, assignments are not perfect, but you can see that the application of one, zero is of one unit is rare, but more is common. And um, you have to go into individual cases and look. And even if you even look at here, the proton implies that like in these plots you see that uh, in this plot here, up in this region up here, it's very hard to see any pattern. It is probably something like grayish in this corner here, but it's not a clear pattern. But starting from no, number eight, there's a clear pattern. So how how these evolved? And uh, this may be evolved in different ways. So they are too old, or maybe it's evolved by one by one. I mean, so there are clear things are different different parts of a protein. I mean, if you have many proteins together, so so this averaging is maybe not very useful. And this is what you see here. But it, but it's a bit interesting. There were people even writing. It was even a Nature paper about saying that. People that this is zero is underrepresented, or this one is underrepresented. Underrepresented, represented. They have an idea why, but because similar proteins should interact more, similar domains should interact more. I don't think that's correct, but so I won't tell you. So we, we went on to study this nebulin a bit more carefully. So this is a like typical thing that people can do. Uh, so this is the nebulin gene. So it's very very long gene, and uh, every. Uh, Red, uh, uh, every red or green or colored bar here is one, uh, one domain. And so you see, so and then they're colored according to the exon somehow. So they one of these boxes is one exon. And the interesting thing is that even the exons here are, they don't, I mean, it's, it's, you could believe that exons would fit domains perfectly. It would be easy to shuffle them. That's not the case. There are, uh, in many cases, I mean, this is actually a rare case, but it actually seems to overlap quite well. So one exon, in most cases, corresponds to one domain, or well, actually it corresponds to two halves of one domain, because it takes the second part of one domain and the first part of the next domain, but the same length. But there are some exons, like the green ones are two, and the blue ones are three long. So, they, so these exons can, can span two or three domains. So you have a clear pattern of seven domains, or four exons, that is repeated here. Many times you can see it very clearly here, and then there's some other proteins that are called NRAP and nebulet and LASP that also have the same type of domains, but they're much shorter. And you can see the nebulet is similar to that part of it, that doesn't have this repeat pattern. NRAP is more similar to the N terminal part, and LASP is well, it's similar to the part of nebulet. So you can go on that. If you look at this map, it's the pattern is very very clear. This is a, a very nice repeated pattern. You can Oh, everybody sees that they are nice repeats here. There are some cases here with not things. If you, it, it was some small tricks you need to do because some of the assignments were not perfect, so you missed some domains. So if you took the original data, you would have to see those shifts here and there. But that's because the domain assignment was not perfect. But if you fix that, it looked better. So that's, that's basically, if you take the, the dark lines are with the gaps, basically fixed alignments, fixed assignments. Otherwise, we see it's still still seven. So this is the peak, this is 7, 14, etc. You still see this peak, but it gets much down, much weaker, and it's not as clear here, and it's a bit shifted even. So we have alignment gaps. But otherwise, we have a very, very nice pattern like that. So as I said, this is kind of the unit. We have one, so we have what we call a, 
structural unit here, or you have two exons, two single exons, I mean, a dub, an exon that is length of two domains, and two one domain exon and a three domain exon. And actually, as you see here, the domains are perfectly in the middle of the exons. And that's not because it's the wrong assignment of domains, definition of domains, it's really the case this. And then well, this is because this is a uh, the helix. This is one helix basically here in the middle. In the loops of that. And if you look at the ends, that is, that is correct. There is a branchiostoma, which is uh, half uh, very, very early vertebrate, which is not really a vertebrate, has a very different pattern. So in humans, you have if you look at just the exon patterns, you have one of these, three of these, and two of these, and nineteen of these, and three of these, and two of these. Well, in, 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 in Pachystomy have a very different pattern. You have this one is a dominating one exon pattern. This is the common one. And uh, there are two proteins, SR1 and SR2, and these are have the same exon pattern, both of them. But they actually are quite different. So if you look, just take these seven domain repeats here between, take, compare that one, that one, and that one to each other. So here you have human, human, of course, you see that the average similarity is very high in the middle. In the Pachystoma, they are very similar to each other in the middle. There is some similarity between 1 and 7 in SR2, maybe between 3 and 6 in SR1. But there are no really, if you look at the patterns between the different ones, there's no patterns at all. It's not like you can't see how, they, how they, these have evolved with each other. So we assume that this pattern of 7 have evolved independently. And the same thing. Uh, yeah, if you take the end wrap, the other, the other human protein is very similar to the so the end wrap is similar to the human uh, nebrin. And chicken, and, uh, if you take chicken, uh, so yeah, all the animals look the same basically. So basically, we, we, we argue here that this pattern of seven domains duplicated many times has evolved probably three times, two twice in Bacchistoma and once in the, all the other animals, all other vertebrates. You can even find a very recent application if you read in the details here. You can look at patterns down here that is much stronger than anything else. It's not so easy to see it there, but when you look at the DNA plot, you can see. It. So this is DNA, the same time, it's just a dot plot, really, of the genome against itself. And you can see some patterns down here. So even on the DNA level, you'll see the pattern there. So this is a very recent application. I don't think it is, it's after chimpanzee, so it's, it's not in the... Well, it's all in all humans, but it doesn't exist in ship or sea. So you can, if you go be careful, you can look at these events and you can see something. This is our T of this. So like here we gain four of these seven domain repeats. Well, no, it was before ship or sea, but, but, but it was in the primate lineage. The cow and the horse have gained a couple also. The elephant have gained three. The platypus have gained one and three. And these together have gained three. So we can, we can basically see how things were added. It's not obvious that it's, so we had an original level in only 16 of these repeats, now we have 20, between 26, 17 and 25. So, so, and of course what we do there is of course, basically look at big alignments, we look at these things here, we look at the things that look like. And when this takes a bit of manual work to, to clear it out, so if you look completely automatically, you get other problems. So this just shows you somehow how repeat how proteins evolve. That there are I mean, it's not simple things. It's not just single point mutations. There are other, other things that are probably very important for functional evolution. Another type of proteins that have a similar problem is is, is plasma membrane proteins. I don't think going to talk about this, but he this is he talked about the proteins. So there, so there are. It has been known for some time that um, there are often internal symmetries in the membrane proteins. This is. Uh, how do you see it there maybe? So this is actually this is actually two halves of the same protein that are perfectly superposed to each other. So you see you take the first half and second half, one is blue and one is red, and you see that they are basically identical. So just from a structure point of view. And this, this was noted quite some time ago, and we did a study a few years ago that we do let me work carefully. And we decided to ask first how frequent is it? So we s if you this is number of transmembrane helices in the protein, and we try to estimate the fraction of that was had an internal symmetry. And the seven ones that, that I guess we're going to talk about the GPCRs do not have it. There's no internal symmetry that we can find. 
while, but all others around have it about almost 50 percent on average have it. If you have less than six class member here, you can look at it because there are two plus two applications also, but we there are not so many we skip them. And we did some predictions in some uh, different organisms, and we end up with slightly lower numbers. But it, it's a large, it's still about one third of the photos. Yeast was maybe slightly less, I don't know if it was significant, and E. coli was even slightly higher, but I don't know, these are predictions, so I don't know if they're any different. Uh, we try, you, you can do this and look at the gene. So you, get, you can take some of these proteins that have these applications. And you can look at all the homologs in the in the genome and see how many transmembrane helices they have. So a typical protein you find that has some of this, it has 10. In some cases you have 8, 9, 11, 12. Either that is because you add or lose one helix in the beginning, or it's because you do, we do bad predictions, so, or the genes, so it's just a mistake. So th it's not that strange. But then you have, in some cases here we have five. And, and this one is maybe, oh, maybe it's, it's something interesting here. Maybe I have to go from eight to ten, but maybe that's just a misassignment. But this is an interesting case. We have one group which has six, and one group that has twelve, and then plus minus one, but it's probably our, our bad predictions and all that, and that's so you can look at proteins that have five helices or twelve helices, and if you look at in different genomes, you find and ask how, how many proteins exist of a five helix protein or five six seven or uh, eleven twelve thirteen, and you can spot that. So either the proteins that have um, uh, five six seven, you have either zero or two, and then other things like that. So that means that a 5, 6, 7 protein, you need two of them. Or you either have nothing of it, or you have two, because they are interacting as a dimer. While if you have uh, 11, 12, 13 other proteins, you can have uh, zero, or one, or two, or three, four, or many, or even many composites. But this one, you really never ever have one. You have a few cases, but that's probably because you missed some assignments. We can look at this protein. It's called it called sec FT. So, they, it, so basically, oh, it's not just a plot, but um, we can look at uh, we can make evolution tree here, and the colored are so that they are uh, the blue and red part are the N and C terminal part of a big protein. That protein has twelve transmembrane regions plus so it's first second half of it, and the gray colors are the ones that have six transmembrane helices. So you can see that basically you have four clusters. You have one cluster down here, one cluster here, one here, here. So these are all the C terminals, parts of all many proteins of the so-called acroflavins, and this is the M terminal. So they clearly, once this protein was fused here, they see it um, at, the, at the fusion time, there was two proteins that fused together, or it was one protein that was duplicated, and then the N terminal, C terminal has evolved differently. So they all they have been in the rearrangements. Then there's a cluster here which is more mixed, which is a bit interesting. And it's not, so either it's been many of these mixing of ends that are different, or has been rearranged or something like that, because it's, cl it's clear that some of these proteins, so this protein here have most of the red are here, most of the blue are here, so there have been another fusion here or something like that. It's not really clear exactly what's happened. And then there's a separate part of the ones that are C terminal. No, they are, they are short, so they are down here. There are a few short ones up here, but not very many. So they, they have really evolved. Separately, so we probably started with these, and then they were fused together, and then they, uh, these things uh, evolved. Or at least was one protein here was, uh, that was duplicated here, and then they evolved separately. So they also, they also the sec F and sec D are separate to each other. So if you do this type of thing, you can actually get quite a lot of insights into evolution, history, function of these proteins, and in this case, actually, we even think we know the structure of it. So we have some ideas. So that's the last part I want to look at is a question or I talk about is something that we studied. Is that, that so far we talked about protein evolution in large sense. But there's a question, when did the first protein arrive? When did it first evolve? How did we get to it? And are the new proteins coming all the time? And there has been the before the genome era, 
it was some kind of belief that all the genes evolved a long time ago, but never, and then basically it was extremely rare to, to evolve new genes. It was just applications, small mutations that happened. But what surprised when the first genomes were coming out was that there were many genes that didn't have any similarity to anything else. So like if you look at this plot with the PFAM assignments, we have like 20% of the genomes that are unassigned, and we can't find any similarity to anything else. So we studied this a few years ago when we looked at into yeast, as we went into second mises, and there we have had lots of genomes. I mean, now we have even more, but in those days, so we knew there was a duplication of the whole genome, so the whole genome duplication. So basically, we had two copies of the whole genome before the split of second mises, or so the second mises lineage, but we split away from the chlamydia and the other genes. But otherwise, so you can compare these, these, these second recesses to all other yeast genomes. And you can do basically what fraction are unique, uh, uh, like in the domains, how many genes are only found here and nowhere else, and how many are only found here and nowhere else, etc. So you can do that and you find that the ones that are unique for second recesses are uh, it's probably in the order of well, this is probably the one or two proteins. No, this is the uh, mm, yeah, this is well, in, in, in the order of one or two percent. The one that's unique Saccharomyces is probably two percent, one or two percent of the genome. The one that's unique down here is very, very small. It's just a few, less than one percent. But for the whole Saccharomyces gender, there are uh, it's quite a lot. It's a couple of percent. So a couple of percent, the six thousand genes would be hundred proteins. Sorry. Oh. And uh, you, we can look at some characteristics of this. So for instance, obviously they are quite short. So this is the so, so unique because they are most of them are very short and rarely over 100 amino acids long, so they're very short. Uh, they are. They are actually you. Some people thought it should be repeated, but actually they're not very repeated. So this is the complexities, so like they are repeats the same thing. They're actually not very over represented. Uh, and then also there's been arguments that they were disordered, but they were actually not very disordered. These here, this group here, are a little bit older, but created they're mainly disordered. And our belief is that these are mainly because actually they, they, we cannot find the home because they're evolving very fast. Uh, this is the same thing again. Um, well, the final thing we 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 try to look at basically what do they do, and it's very hard. But basically, if you look at these proteins here; they are unique. There was a few hundred of these. Most of them are uncharacterized. We have no idea what they're doing, and they have really. We can't say that they are very common. They have these knockout studies. So many of them have not even been tried, but the ones that were tried didn't have any effects. Uh, and they are. But some of them are found in the protein interaction networks. So you have found interaction studies that directly identify them. So that was my last slide. So there were just some examples of what you can do with these kind of domain assignments and uh, how you can learn evolution and other, other things from, from them. Any questions?